Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us for this important WCET one-on-one -on -one conversation. We have a terrific guest today to answer many of your questions about the coronavirus. And I'll do a brief introduction. I'm Megan Raymond. For those of you in our membership community that don't know me, I direct our programs and sponsorship here. So I'd like to go ahead and jump into introductions with our fabulous guest speaker. Thanks, Megan. Uh, my name is Garrett Barker. I'm the Senior Director for Public Health Preparedness at ASTO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. We're a membership organization that represents the 59 men and women who are the lead health commissioners in the states, territories, and freely associated states. Uh, I've been in this position about 10 years, and prior to that, I served at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment for approximately 27 years. So I have a long experience in this area. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for making time. We know it's a really busy time for you. So <laughs> give us a view of the landscape currently of coronavirus and what states are doing, what we need to know, how to prepare. Sure. Um, this is a pretty remarkable and, and historic situation we're dealing with right now. Uh, coronaviruses themselves are not that unusual. There are about seven of them. We've, in fact, the common cold is caused by a coronavirus. Um, we have seen outbreaks of, of significance in the in the past few uh, years, SARS, MERS, things of that sort. We haven't really seen anything like this. Um, this this is a respiratory infection that uh, is transmitting very quickly. Um, we know that it's more transmissible than the common cold. We know, and or influenza. We also know that uh, it's it's more fatal. Um, we, we estimate right now that it's about a two percent fatality rate compared to the seasonal influenza, which is about 0.1. Um, so, so it's a it's an extraordinary circumstance. It has really quickly traveled across the the world, and uh, we're up, as of this morning, we're up to uh, 12 states. We're over 100 cases nationally. And we've had six deaths in the United States, all in uh, Washington State. Uh, we could easily be over a thousand by this point next week. So it's 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 a remarkable public health event that really requires an all nation response. When you say a thousand, is that deaths or is that just people that are testing positive? About a thousand cases. I I think we could be at at this point next next week. There's an old uh, saw in uh, public health that you find what you look for. So uh, if we're going to start looking for more cases, if we're going to start testing more people, we're going to find more cases. It just works that way. Sure. So what are the state responses and what should our institutions be proactively planning to do? Well, state health departments uh, are, are really the coordinating body within a state for um, the, the total response as to um, all aspects of, of the community. So uh, coordinating health care, uh, uh, health education, uh, communication to the public, um, and, and issuing guidance as to what the community mitigation is going to be. So um, we use terms like mitigation that uh, originally, in the first few weeks of this response, you saw things like screening people at airports. They're trying to contain who comes into the country and who might be infected. Well, we've now passed that point. It's too expensive. It's too uh, labor intensive. Can't do things like that anymore. So now we're looking at containment. How do we contain the area in which uh, the infection takes place? How many people spread within, within a community? Universities play a huge part in that because uh, in, in, in universities where um, um, you have a, a contained population, oftentimes in a small area, or you have uh, a, a university or a college that uh, is really the, the focal point of a community. So uh, people from outside the, the institution come into the university or college uh, for their entertainment, for their employment, for, for a lot of other things play a huge role. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very important for, for schools to be prepared. And where should they be accessing information, the CDC or from their state agency? Well, great question. Uh, certainly what we want is for you to use trusted sources. And so I would say cdc.gov is, is the best place to go. They now have uh, a page specifically for the COVID-19 mm -hmm. response. 
Um, one of the things you'll see on the home page is a place that says what's new. So if you go back one day and come back the next, you'll see what's new since the last time you were there. Um, they issue guidance routinely. There was guidance issued a couple of days ago for um, uh, students who are traveling abroad. Um, there's guidance on the Super Tuesday for uh, polling places. There's, mm -hmm. there's always new guidance documents that are coming out. And then the state health departments are, are another great place to, to go as well. They distribute the information from the federal government, all the different sources, but uh, in many cases they're producing their own materials too. Terrific. And along those lines of communication, how should our institutions best communicate to their faculty, staff, and students? Well, I, I, that's, a, that's a really good question. I've, th I've thought about that. I, I think you want to look, you, you know your community best. So how do you routinely communicate with them? Mm -hmm. if, you're a, if you're a school that um, communicates through, through emails or through um, uh, text messaging service or something like that, then continue to do that. If, on the other hand, you have a uh, some sort of online portal or a website or something that people are used to routinely checking, then use that. You know your population. You know how you communicate with them. That's, many schools, many schools have have maybe set up an emergency response protocol right. uh, for for active shooters or for other things of that type. So if if that's the way that that students and and staff are acclimated to. Uh, turn for information in an emergency, then maybe that's the way to go. Sure, and are there any cultural sensitivities that we need to address in our messaging or our website updates? Well, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we've heard across the country is um, the stigma that's being uh, directed towards, for, towards persons from China. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in some ways it's a, um, uh, it, it's a minor thing, uh, making sure that the, the Chinese businesses in your area, the Chinese restaurants and others are, are continuing to be, to be frequented and supported. And, and, um, but, but it's more than that. Um, certainly in a, in a school that might have a, a large international student body, the stigma that can be directed towards uh, those from uh, China or other parts of Asia is, is a very real thing. And I mentioned the... Uh, the CDC website, they have a, uh, a page specifically devoted to that, specifically devoted to stigma. I think, um, yeah, I think that's, that's how, it's re how it's referred to there. Um, and uh, coming back to, to state and local um, agencies, most state health departments will have a social and behavioral health component, and I know they're looking at these issues too. Great. And what about uh, when you speak about behavioral and mental health and let's think more about the student service aspect. So how do we continue to serve our students that are typically used to being face to face, but may be uh, forced to a hybrid or an online environment? How do we continue to serve those students? And along those same lines, food insecurity and that type of thing is an issue for students as well. So I think we need to evaluate if it makes sense to close a campus, knowing that many students that rely on these services are going to be without? I think this falls into the category of continuity of operations. So most employers, let alone uh, schools and universities, have a, um, a continuity of operations plan. Mm -hmm. And it, it might be originally developed for, for some sort of natural disaster, a hurricane or a tornado or, or, or a blizzard in Colorado. Uh, so, um, but but oftentimes they don't have a lot of meat to them. They they might say something like, um, in, in your case, it might say something like, um, "We'll we'll have all our classes be online." But you really haven't thought through what does that mean to have all the classes online. Right. So how do we go about doing that? And I'm no expert in in your field, but I think what what all employers and certainly a school as an employer need to be doing is looking at their continuity of operations and plan and say, have we really thought through all the various issues here? Have we uh, tested, uh, do, do, do people know what it means to, to telework? Do, do professors know what it means to teach the class remotely? How does our Wi-Fi uh, sustain all of that? Mm -hmm. All those elements that 
maybe have been uh, assumed need to be really thought through, tested, and exercised. Um, you know, you mentioned food in particular. Um, you know, food, food handling is a public health issue anyway. And so now, uh, if you've got the potential for transmission of other types of infections in a, in a food service environment, now you've really got to get uh, the sanitarians and the environmental health and the, the food safety people and all those people engaged and also looking at what are the alternatives. If we can't bring everybody into a large cafeteria, how are we going to um, uh, serve, the, serve food to people who may be uh, quarantined or stuck in their dorms or apartments? Sure, that's a good point. And if there were to be some um, a, a state of emergency declared at the state or the national level, then what would that timeline look like? What would institutions be anticipating in terms of a extended closure? Well, uh, two, two points there. Uh, states of declarations of states of emergency, and right now there's one in Washington and there's one in Florida, are, are often more of a bureaucratic type thing. So if, if a governor declares a state of emergency, what that means is they're eligible for certain types of federal funding and uh, they, they could have some additional legal authorities to take particular actions. So that alone, although it's a declaration of emergency, doesn't mean there's an emergency. It means that they're prepared for one. Um, but but if, in terms of timing, I think we have to look at what's going on in other places in the world. So in Japan, they've closed schools for a month. Uh, they've said that um, we're going to close schools for a month. We're going to take that time to um, uh, get through a couple of incubation periods to sanitize the, the facilities, and then we'll reevaluate. And I think that's what we would face in, in this country is some block of time, probably fairly arbitrary, and then um, continued reassessment of how long um, it could be. But I think you plan for the long term. You plan for two or three months and, and hope it turns out to be less than that. Wow. Well, and considering that some of our employees within an institution are union employees, you know, we can't necessarily just force them to go online. There's some issues there. So what do you advise along those lines? Well, that gets back to the emergency declaration. I, I, I think in this planning stage, which, which we're still there, we're still just in the planning stage. If a school were, already knew that they had this, this union contract that could pose uh, a, an impediment, I'll say, uh, to, to taking some sort of action, this is a good time for the attorneys to look at what the options are and what uh, the authorities the governor has if declaring a state of emergency. This is going to vary state to state. So if, if a particular governor has the authority to declare a state of emergency, what does that mean in your state? Does that mean you could override a, a union contract? Does it not? My guess is it'll, be, it'll vary state to state. Great. Well, it's a lot to consider. Do you have any other words of wisdom or guidance for us? Well, um, a couple of other things I, I think would be prudent to be thinking about. And one is the issue of mass gatherings, whether it's, whether it's a concert or a, or a ball game or something else. What, what is the school going to look at and what are they going to consider for um, uh, restricting mass gatherings? And the other is uh, what to do if you're sick. So, um, you know, we, we use the term a lot, triggers. What is the, what's the trigger, for example, to start canceling sporting events? Uh, is it 25% is it of the student body sick? Is it, is it whatever you decide it's going to be, you ought to know that ahead of time. Similarly, what's the, what's the trigger for people to start uh, going and seeking care? Um, what we know is we don't want hospital emergency rooms flooded with people who have minor illness, especially when the, the onset of this disease looks a lot like a lot of other things too. Um, there aren't enough tests right now, so health departments are determining criteria for who do I test, how sick do I have to be to be tested, and uh, what, what travel history, for example, what exposure history do I need to have in order to be tested. So. I would suggest a school work with their state or local health department to determine who do we send for testing 
And uh, what questions are we going to ask if they're sick? If, if I have a cough and a, and a runny nose, well, that's probably not worth seeking care right now. But if it's accompanied by a fever, and I've recently been to Italy, well, that's a whole different story. Sure. So you want to determine what those criteria are ahead of time before I send somebody out for care. And do you recommend that the on-campus health department continues to work in its regular capacity, or should they begin referring students elsewhere where these tests may be available? Um, I don't think we're there yet. Right now, the, the tests are, are still pretty limited. So um, I, I think um, all, all hospital facilities are going to want to be prepared for uh, a local provider, whether it's a private physician or a, or a student health center or, or whatever, to, to care for their own um, un, until there's such a time where there's, there's someplace else to send them. Does it make sense to start looking at eliminating um, international travel for our staff, our faculty, and our students? Yeah, I, it probably does, to be honest with you. Um, the, the circumstances in Italy are, are an important one to watch. Um, that came out of nowhere. They, Italy went to over 300 cases seemingly overnight. That could happen elsewhere. The, the virus is now in, in six of seven continents other than Antarctica. Um, it, I talked earlier about how infectious it is. It could really explode overnight just about anywhere. So the CDC website as well as the State Department website can provide you with, with travel advisories, but um, it, it certainly is time to be rethinking. Is, is this something that's really worthwhile? Wow. Well, that makes me want to put my summer plans on hold. I don't know about you. I guess you probably won't have much time off in the near future, I'm guessing. It doesn't look like it. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your time, Jared. Do you have any final thoughts for us? Um, stay in touch with your local health department and with the CDC. Great. And I'll be sending out links to these resources that you referenced as well to our membership community. Great. Well, appreciate your time. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you.